Welcome to Open Conversation, where community, education, and policy meet. I'm your host, Nalia Weber, the Executive Director of the Orleans Public Education Network, and today we're talking about One App. So welcome, welcome, uh, Ramisha and Gary from Ed Navigators, who's here with Open to speak with us about the One App. Um, system. So the reason why we're doing this is because the Orleans Public Education Network wants to make sure that we're on the forefront of helping stakeholders navigate this education system by understanding the policy um, and being empowered to advocate on behalf of students and families. And so you guys know, um, as well as everyone else who will be watching this, that one app is a pretty contentious, um, a pretty contentious subject. There are some parents who are pleased with their experience using one app and there are many who are not. There's also um, a lot of ideas um, and misconceptions and even some truths about the tool. And so we want to clear up a lot of that. Um, we want parents to have really good information and we want them to feel empowered when they go um, to enroll NOLA to select a, a school for their child. Um, at the same time, though, we want to honor um, where people are and what their experiences are. And so we do want to speak a little bit to some of the tensions that are around this tool and how we can alleviate those tensions moving forward. Um, so welcome, Ramisha and Gary. We're very happy to have you here and um, we really appreciate you sharing your expertise with us. First, before we get into like the nitty gritty, if you can describe for us, what exactly is one app? When people say one app, what are they talking about or what should they be talking about? Sure, so one app refers to specifically the application period um, that is managed by the department um, called Enroll NOLA that is within the recovery school district. So there are many different components to the enrollment process as the year progresses, but one app is strictly the centralized application um, process and it's broken into two rounds. There's the main round that occurs in um, from November to February, and then the second round is from April to the end of May. So this year it will be starting on November 1st. Okay, all right. And what does this tool provide for? What exactly is it supposed to do and what are its limitations? What, what are some of the things that it just can't do that you may have heard that parents wish that it did? Uh, yeah, so I guess it's supposed to level the playing field because right now you have over 80 schools in the city for parents to choose from, and that's a lot of schools, and parents have difficulty narrowing down the universal schools. And so this lottery system is supposed to level the playing field for all parents who can have equal access to attend certain schools. When parents rank up to eight schools, Parents don't always get their first, cho first choice, right? Because you have a few schools who are very high demand schools and all parents are vying for those schools, which means that some will get it and some won't. But the lottery system helps to, you know, give all parents equal access in some, some form or fashion. At Open, we focus a lot on equity in systems, um, making sure that people have access and also that those that that access is linked with um, actual needs. So talk, can you talk a little bit more about this tool and how it relates to equity, um, areas where it does that well and areas where it may fall short? Sure, um, it's on its way to increasing equity. One of the challenges that we had pre one app was parents were required to submit individual applications to every school that they were interested in. So that meant completing multiple applications, sharing their demographic information, providing multiple birth certificates, social security cards, and other information to prove that their children were eligible for that school enrollment. And for people who are working full time or jobs that don't allow them much flexibility, it made it very difficult for them to go during these very specific application times. Um, if you didn't have access to a computer or a copy machine, you had to spend resources in order to make multiple cop copies of documents. And then if something wasn't submitted in a way that the school wanted it to be submitted, then you kind of had to go back and reset and do this all over again. So if you um, were fortunate enough to have a flexible job or you were a stay-at-home mom, then you can run around the schools all day and get what you need done. However, if you were the mom that didn't have that access, or should I say mom or dad, um, then you, missed out on opportunities of potentially enrolling your students in higher performance schools. And, but all schools do not participate in one app. Uh, what's up with that? 
Well, because one app initially covered all of the schools that were under the recovery school district because one app started under that department. And um, if I remember correctly, year one um, and two, Orleans Parish schools that were um, direct running authorizers um, also participated in one app, but they left out their pre-K, which was again, another equity thing, right? So like you're allowing K through 12 spots to participate in a centralized enrollment where you may have very few seats open but then your pre-K uh, classes were still under that same, you have to apply everywhere you need to go. And so that way they were able to filter in um, the students that they wanted to have enter their school buildings. Um, now their legislature requires that as we, the contracts that they now need to roll in to participate in the one app process. So we we have this year, um, Audubon is in now, Moton is in, and um, if, I can't remember the exact year, but I think by like 2020, all schools in Orleans Parish will be participating in a centralized enrollment process that are public. And so that's what equity looks like, that students and families have access to every school that is publicly funded in the school district. And we're saying that by 2020, that should be the case. Um, after the unification process is complete. Um, can you speak a little bit to the policies that kind of govern this whole system and this activity? Again, um, policy being a focus of our work, we want to make sure that p parents um, and other stakeholders understand what is written in the law, whether it's school-based, state, federal. What are the specific policies um, that focus on one app in school selection? Um, there are a number that designate, of course, um, how what stu I'm sorry, what eligibility is for like entering pre-K and kindergarten. Um, there is policy specific to enroll NOLA on how parents uh, should apply um, in other parts throughout the school year how they can transfer their students. Um, on the school side, though, which I feel like are the more important policies, and all of these are found on the Enroll NOLA website, are how schools are to interact with parents who participate in this process. So a lot of times, um, as the One App has evolved, uh, schools would use lots of loopholes to still exclude parents who have been placed in their schools. So, way, so there's policies specifically like the seat acceptance, um, policy, the fact that schools can't manage their enrollment, they can't disclose to parents um, if there are seats available, and then the fact that parents need to funnel all their enrollment related um, questions and concerns and processes through the Family Resource Center, um, those are designed to maintain the equity in the actual enrollment process here in the city. So there are some school level policies, at least that were created in the past, um, that allow schools to manipulate to a degree um, their student body. And what you're saying is that with the, with Enroll NOLA and such, that they have placed policies to, to mitigate that or curtail that behavior? Um, yes, and I, so, for example, the seat acceptance policy, I can use that one, that's the easiest one to talk about. Um, so after the one app results come out, parents are notified of their students' placements. And after main round, you have until May 15th to accept your seat. And if you go in there with that piece of paper signed, literally that is the only requirement that a parent has to do, even though a school might say, well, yes, here, go ahead and complete our registration documentation and start submitting your, um, your proof of student eligibility. But there are some schools that would try to say prior to the seat acceptance that they will only allow for you to come and accept your seat um, in a certain window of time. So like you would have to come on very specific days during very specific hours, or they would wait until right up, up on the deadline to say, okay, you can only come this one day. But as long as a parent shows up with that document, they can't deny a parent that seat as long as they come before the 15th. Um, before there's policy set too, where the school has to demonstrate that they have made multiple attempts to contact a parent to notify them of their seat. So even if you didn't get the letter or you didn't get the email, you don't know what seat your child received, the school is supposed to make a reasonable effort and document that before that they can remove them, remove that particular student from their rosters. Okay. Um, talk to me a little bit about the rounds, right? How important is it to be a part of any of the two main rounds before you get into like summer 
um, when you're trying to select your child, like in July or something, is it to participate in the November round versus the February, like, or does it really not make a difference? It definitely makes a difference. We encourage parents to definitely participate in the first round because that's when the most of the seats are up for grabs that are available. Um, and then the high demand schools that I mentioned earlier walk within the first round, unless parents, you know, parents don't claim those seats, then they go up in for round two. But most of the high demand schools are pretty much set after the first round. So we tell parents to definitely put their applications in. And a lot of parents have the idea that if they put it in, the misconception, I would say, if they put the application in, in November 1st versus January 15th, they have a better shot. They don't, parents need to understand that the round is from November to February. So they have those months to like put the one app. And within that time frame, they can go in and change and adjust uh, as they learn more about particular schools. Um, mm -hmm. so, but parents, you know, don't like their choice for the first round. We then, of course, encourage them to do round two because some seats do become available. But again, the higher demand schools, you don't see much moving because parents claim those seats pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, you may be able to um, points about this. If not, it's okay. Your experience um, in this matter will be uh, will be fine. But what we are learning um, through our work with the equity index um, and, and other tools that for these high demand schools, there aren't that many because the student retention rate is quite high. Right. Um, so we have a lot of people trying to um, grab a few seats at these really high demand schools about how you would counsel a family who wants for their child to go to one of the few select A or B schools in the city, knowing that they have few seats actually available. Yeah, we spend a lot of time in schools at Navigator. We go into a lot of school visits. Um, of course, not just the A and B schools, but also the C schools and you know other schools as well to try to give parents more context on how schools are performing, schools that they might not normally be attracted to just because of the letter grade. Mm -hmm. And so we tell parents only put schools that you can really see your kid attending because obviously you have a, you have a, up until eight you know choices. But like if you don't see your kid going to all eight of those schools, then don't put those schools down. Right, only put the three or four schools you can see your kid attending. And um, and we were very honest with parents about, you know, the chances around getting to those high demand schools. We say, look, there are a certain amount of seats, as you mentioned, Nala, and like your child may get in, your child may not. If your child does not get in, what is your contingency plan? What is your plan B? And this may be a C school, but this may be a C school that has demonstrated lots and lots of growth, right? This may be a school that knows how to move kids academically. And so we break down the conversation with parents like on a nuanced level so they understand that, hey, my child may not get into car, but hey, here's another school that may not be a, an A school, but my child might be successful at this school. So maybe I should give this school a shot uh, as a term in, in terms of like ranking it on the one app. Um, so it's those conversations that we have with parents because we are in the schools every day, seeing what schools have to offer. And the parents that we work with, they don't have the luxury of being able to take off of work to do school in-depth school visits. So we try to provide that service to them so they can make um, an informed decision. Okay, so you talked about growth um, as a factor that parents should be looking at. What are some of the other particular aspects of a school um, that parents should be thinking about that may not be very apparent in their letter grade? Oh, sure, I can take that. Um, and I'll take that one because I'm actually participating in one app this year. Um, and I know that the letter grade only gives so much information. And so there are other things that are very important to me. So discipline, so whether they have zero tolerance versus having that restorative justice um, discipline level, um, I'm, I'm particularly sensitive now to uniforms um, because uniform costs are very, very excessive. And as a parent of a daughter and son, I know that my daughter's uniforms at particular schools are disproportionately higher than the uniforms for my son. So I know that if a school has flag, I'm not even interested. Like I don't, I don't want to consider them at all. Um, if it's a mandatory plan. Um, curriculum is in, important. Um, availability of of after school or a, what is that? No, what is that? I can't remember. The um, aftercare, sorry, I can't remember. Aftercare, um, what other enrichment programs that they may have, you know, like how some people have edible schoolyards, some people have arts focus, some people focus on technology. So there's so many different things that we can look at. And also, and I'll drop a, 
a line about the equity index that's important is like I want to know how long teachers have been working at that school and how much experience they have. And these are also things that we try to tease out in our conversations with parents by asking very open-ended um, questions about what they want, what type of environment they want to see their, their students in. Have you had an experience where you've had these kinds of conversations with parents counseling them or working with them to identify a good fit school that's based on all of these other um, things that Ramisha um, and you, Gary, have raised, and that school just happened to be a C or D school? Yeah, that's happened before. Um, you know, if, if the thing about what we do, when we counsel parents, we, like, we're, we're always honest and give them our you know, straight opinion about like, what we think about particular schools. And if the parent decides, hey, based on you know, my thoughts about what I want for my kid, I feel like this school is the right school for me. They're our bosses. They tell us what they want because they know their kids better than you know we do, and we go with it. But we also tell them like, okay, if your kid is attending a C or D school, we're gonna make sure we're in that school, getting to know the teachers, knowing the curriculum, all the things that uh, Ramisha mentioned, so that that parent can be fully uh, performing that particular school. Um, because culture matters a ton to parents. Parents are always asking us. What is the culture of the school? What does the school feel like? How are students communicating with students? How are students communicating with teachers and vice versa? Those are the things that, those are the questions that parents are asking and they get so much of the information, uh, not just on their role, NOLA, of course, but like the word of mouth, right? What What is my neighbor saying about this school? I went to this school when I was a kid, so this was my experience. I want my child to have a similar experience. So it's so much of those different factors that, that are swirling around a parent's head as they make decisions about where to send their kid. Right. I would also add, add here that it's important for um, parents to know why that letter grade looks the way that it does, like how it's broken down um, and what the different um, considerations and factors were that came up with that um, letter grade. So, I mean, essentially, we want all parents to have access to only A and B schools, right? And so when we see Ds and Fs and Cs, I think that we need to probe a little bit deeper to figure out why it is that way and if the school is on the cusp of getting better or if it's, um, or what factors may be contributing to it actually regressing and going and getting behind. So, um, so that is cool, thank you for that. Um, but parents, uh, I hear things all the time about how they're very frustrated with one app. They go into the system, they think the game is rigged. Um, and I don't want to discount um, any of those concerns. What are some of the frustrations that you hear about the one app tool? What are some of the particular aspects of it that parents may be calling out that they think that just inherently aren't fair? Well, I think one of them is, is that they didn't get into their first choice school, right? Um, I think that's the biggest one. And based on like everything we talked about, especially as it relates to the high demand schools, um, ensuring that parents truly understand like their odds of entering in a program um, is very important. Um, having them understand why it, the algorithm plays out the way it is is one that I think that would help a lot of parents understand how they rank schools and making their choice so that they have a, a cool video on their website that explains the actual process um, in a very user-friendly way. Comes up a lot of times is that parents will say, oh, well, I was put in a school that I didn't list. And that one comes up frequently. And so my response usually to that is, is did you verify when you got your confirmation email that the schools that you listed were on there because it's very difficult for the algorithm to place a parent in a school that they didn't select. So uh, more often than not, it's user error. Um, so ensuring that parents really understand how to go in and make their application and then ensure that they rank the schools the way they wanted to. Um, because in instances where I think the rare chance that it has happened, like if they go back to enroll NOLA and they find out that they're about, they will go back and rerun the match and then put them where they should have been placed. Um, let's see, are there any other ones to come up? Those are the main Those two. Yeah. Um, and one thing I'm always stressing to parents is really pay attention to how far away a school is because um, I've had, had experiences in the past working at Enrolnola where a parent would come in and be like, well, y'all put me in a school that was way across town. And my response is, well, ma'am, look, you have it listed on your application, and then once they realize that, oh wait, that was across town, um, then it's like, okay, well now I need to reapply, and now they've missed out on a chance to maybe get into a school that might have fit 
you know, distance wise. So I just caution parents that as they're exploring schools to be sure that they understand like how the schools are performing, where the school is located, what, who will they have as support to reach their kids in, um, in case of emergencies, right? Because that's, that's a cru crucial thing too, I might add. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about the algorithm. What kinds of choices, how is it moving, right? If I have a child and let's say, let's say I have two children um, who are a couple of grades apart, what are some of the things that are going to happen in that process? Um, if I have a child at one school and I have a child that's about to enter um, the K through 12 um, system, how might that change things? So talk to me a little bit about the algorithm and how it moves and sorts students into schools. Okay, so bear with me with the whole, it's a whole, it's, okay, so it's a whole bunch of different, I, I'm working on a document right now to help families um, understand, I call it the one app pathway. Right. So you mentioned a couple of different scenarios and a lot of it starts with the parent and which direction they want to take. So if we take your first scenario where you have um, a child that's in school and a child that's entering school, if you want the child that's entering school to attend the same school as the child that's already in school, then it's just a matter of making sure that they're both on your application and you apply for your new student to um, go to the school that your current student is attending as their first choice. Now, of course, you can add other choices after that. So you do nothing to current child, you make new child, the current child first school, I'm sorry, the current school's first choice, and then whatever one's after that. But if you want to move your child, then that's when it kind of can get a little money. So you can either do something called family link, which means you will rank all of the schools on both applications the exact same way. And I mean the exact same way, because if you add, if you rank five schools on one and six schools on the other, even though the first five schools match the first child, they are not exactly the same and the link is broken. Um, so you can try to get both kids placed in the same school at the, at your highest choice, or you can break that family link and plan to say, okay, I'm going to rank, kid A in these schools and I'm going to rank kid B in these schools and then whatever schools they get into, whichever one is higher, then I'm going to take round two and I'm going to use seven priority to get into the next school. All right, that's um, a gamble. <laughs> yeah, it is, but I've, I've known people to do it um, and it and it works. And so it then from there, like it branches off into all of these different things that you can do after those two rounds. So then it's like going to late enrollment and then going there every day until you find, you know, the seat that you want. Um, if you're new to the city, again, it's almost the same process. Like you would apply either using your family link or you would apply breaking it and then make it, you know, just whichever, whichever way the cards fall, then you make a decision on what you want to do from there. Um, some parents prefer their kids to be in separate schools, and that even though that's a very small population of folks, it seems to work out for them. Um, so really, it's based on what they, what the parent wants to happen for this process, and then from there, the algorithm will take over. Okay. Now I've heard. I tried to um, have like a dummy account created during this last round in the spring, so that I can go in there and just kind of see. Hey, if I was a parent, I was trying to do this. What would happen? I wasn't able to this time. I'm going to try again though. But I've heard from people who've gone through this process some some wild things um, that I would like you to speak on. So one um, concern that had been brought up in some other conversations is that the one app system asked for your family income and they asked for that information apparently quite early in the process that that might be used as a way to sort kids into different um, gr differently graded schools. What would you have to say to that? I would say that the only reason why your income will be asked is if you're applying for a child that's four years old or younger. Um, the, the early childhood portion of one app covers a number of different types of programs. So it covers early Head Start, it covers, it covers Head Start, it covers uh, it's, uh, the non-public early childhood um, program. It covers, um, it was covering, and it, I don't think it's doing this year, it, but at the time it was covering um, different privately owned daycare centers that 
have uh, child care assistance. And so I can speak especially for Early Head Start and Head Start. They, you're required to prove your income for those programs, whether you were in one app or not, because the two eligibility factors to participate in those programs is age and income. So in order to make sure that you qualify for certain programs, asking you to, to disclose your income information so that it can give you a list of schools that your child is actually eligible for. Okay. Um, I've also heard from some parents who just, they don't like any of the, um, that they have and they're just like, I can't, um, that is very, very difficult to move. And they feel like this is a, this is an equity issue. It's an access issue because if they truly had choice, they should be able to exercise the choice to be mobile throughout the system and move their child where they will want them to be or to be able to access different options than the one that they were given. So if you talk a little bit more about how an app treats movement of, of student bodies, um, how does it relate to the transfer process? If I wanted to transfer my child, do I have to go through some other kind of one app process throughout the year? Can you talk, can you speak a little bit um, about movement and mobility throughout this system using one app? Okay, so when you apply for one app, so let's remember one app is just the application period. That's it. Um, so when you apply for one, during one app, you're exercising your choice to rank your schools and hope that you get placed in the one um, that you want to get into the most. So that's from November to February, and then again from May. I'm sorry, from April to May. So in June, there's this period called late enrollment. Now it sounds very derogatory because it's like insinuating that people just didn't do what they were supposed to do and therefore now they just have to pick from whatever's left um but that period is essentially from july until september 30th so if you want to bounce around from school to school you, you have the freedom to do so from july to september 30th and, and to get into the school that you want to get into but after october once october 1st hits the um it does tighten up very very quickly, um, and it's for a number of reasons. So October 1 is also the deadline in which schools have to submit their student enrollment and have to verify it for funding. So after that, there is, if you have a child that started on October 1st, but then October 2nd, you decided you wanna move, you're, you're impacting a school's ability to receive financial support to educate children. Um, and another thing is, is that um, there's this notion of have, ensuring that students are stable. So usually by October 1st, you've bought school supplies, you've bought uniforms and things like that. And so it should be something very egregious that would, would, need, would cause the need for you to transfer for your student. Now, it could be that you moved from one part of the city to the other part of the city. And although most schools in the city provide transportation, you know, citywide, it could be, you know, you might want to move your child for other reasons outside of that. And so they, the hardship transfer process covers a couple of different categories. So that particular category would be the child care category, meaning that their, that your ability to ensure that your child is properly taken care of is impacted by remaining at this school. Um, there's another one that's called the medical uh, trans hardship transfer, which means that your child has experienced some type of medical situation that requires you, them to receive some type of specialized care or et cetera, and, and as a result, they need to move schools. Um, those two aren't used that often. The transfer that's used the most, there's two of them. There's the safety transfer, because there might be instances of bullying, or in some cases, like the kid is just constantly getting in trouble and they're trying to avoid um, the student from being expelled. And then there's other one called the principal to principal transfer, which hasn't been being used the way it was supposed to be used. Because a lot of times what is what I've observed is that parents are upset with school and they don't go through the proper grievance process within that school building to try to resolve their issues. And then they're just like, you know what, I don't want to deal with it. I'm just gonna change my child to another school. And so what Enrollnola has built in is, okay, well, no, you need to prove that you've at least taken steps to try to resolve whatever concern or issue that you've had with school. So after October 1st, Enrollnola more often than not acts as an intermediary, sometimes between parents and schools to help them um, resolve whatever issues that are happening. And then if it can't be resolved, then they will make the decision to help move the school, the child to a different school. But the problem is, is that, 
once October 1 hits, you really, if you don't feel like you have choice back in November and May and July, you really don't have any choice. So that's mm -hmm. something that parents need to also consider. Okay. And on this issue of choice, there are a lot of parents who say, I choose my neighborhood school. <laughs> And I feel like that choice is removed from me when I have to participate in this system. So if you talk a little bit about there are some schools that do consider um, the distance of the, the surrounding neighborhood in terms of their enrollment. Um, you talked a bit about how many schools are doing that um, and how parents can get access to their neighborhood school if that's what they want. Well, and Ron Ola puts out a report every year after one app fit, wraps up. And in every report since this process has started, very few people are choosing schools within their neighborhoods. Hmm. Very few. Um, and so like we hear that argument all the time, but yet folks aren't putting their neighborhood school on their application as their first, second, or third choice. And a lot of times that's because their neighborhood school is not a higher performing school. And they can't, and we and it, there's been many instances in which geographic priority doesn't come into play because there's folks that we hear all the time. I moved into Alice Hart's district. I moved into Bethune's, you know, geographic zone, and I still couldn't get my baby in the school. Well, that's because the algorithm isn't. Uh, geographic priority is really one of the last priorities in the whole grand scheme of assigning students to a school. And I will reiterate to go look at the video for a much friendlier um, explanation of how the algorithm works. Okay. All right. So what are, what would you say to parents? What advice would you give them with tools and resources to, to help them be proactive about this, um, to not just understand the tool and how it works, but like I said, going into that interaction with the tool, what should parents have with them that's going to at least the, the process um, in terms of you um, listing the schools that you want that that goes um, well and um, if you and whatever tools or information a parent needs to know to kind of not a hundred percent ensure but at least elevate the chances of them getting the schools that they want what would you say to parents about that I think parents should definitely like, uh, you know, put pen to paper and list out the things that they want to see in the school for their kid. I uh, mean, no parents don't have the luxury of, like I mentioned earlier, going around to every school to kind of vet uh, individual schools. But like if they had a list of things that they wanted to see, then they can match that list against the equity index which is an, an amazing tool for parents to compare schools off of or they enroll no little website, which has a lot of demographic information that parents can use and to kind of like sift through. But I also think that parents also should feel empowered to call the school. They can't get like get the principal on the phone and say, hey, I am someone in the market looking for a good school for my kid. What does your school have to offer? I think sometimes uh, parents are intimidated by school because school kind of shuts them out or they're not really engaging with parents. But like parents, they have students and like those students are like the customers, quote unquote, right? So parents should definitely feel empowered to like call individual schools and ask them very tough questions like, okay, what is your discipline policy as Rami said? Like be very targeted and focused on you know their approach and engaging with schools. I think that will begin to shift the dynamic to more for, for school leaders to begin to create schools that are like centered around like parents and communities as opposed to like their sole vision of what a school should look like. Also, parents have to feel empowered to be a part of the process. If not, schools are not going to continue to serve kids in the way that parents and communities want them to serve their kids. Because as I mentioned earlier, parents and communities know their kids best. So schools should be soliciting that feedback from parents on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. before, during, and after the one-app process. I mean, some schools have open houses, but a lot don't. And the ones that do, sometimes they're very infrequent. What would you say to parents about um, themselves um, assuming that agency to get into schools to see what's really going on through that process? Yeah, we definitely encourage parents to attend open houses. Um, but we also know that, you know, sometimes parents will have the time to make it to those. So like parent, parents, like a lot of schools have open door policies aside from open houses. They say, oh, come on in, you can, you can come check out my school. So I think parents should definitely take advantage of those policies that some schools have in place where they say, hey, you can drop in, do a quick informal visit, walk around, get the lay of the land, kind of see you know the feel of the school. And I think um, sometimes some parents don't know that, that that exists in some schools. 
I think that's an os- a possibility as well. And another thing I'll add too is like, even if you can't get into a school, because I'm very sensitive about like instructional time and things like that. But like, if you have time to go like when school lets out and you know, every school has that set of parents that are either in a carpool line or, or, or coming to pick their kids up to walk them home, like sit, sit, ask questions, be like, hey, I'm a, pr- a prospective parent. Um, could you tell me about this feature of your school? And I, I don't know that there'll be any parent that'd be like, I don't, want to answer that question right because most people who have are proud of their schools will be will brag about them all day right yeah i would like yeah definitely parents should talk to other parents you know just kind of roll up <laughs> see who's hanging out there and ask them questions and parents are really good about sharing information i would also say that as publicly funded institutions you have a right to be there um it's your money um that is paying for these schools to operate and so just encouraging parents to not be dismayed or dissuaded in any way by any particular school policy that feels exclusionary or that it doesn't want you there you belong there because you are you are providing a tax base that is providing money to these schools so just definitely want to put that out there as well um so you guys mentioned the enroll nola website um, are there any other places or any other tools that you may use um, to help you make decisions about school quality and that helps parents populate these lists that they take to the one app? Um, yeah, each year when the school grades come up, at Navigator, not, not to self-promote, it's a resource. At Navigator, we uh, calculate grades based on growth. We talked a little bit about that earlier uh, in the webinar. So if parents are very interested about like growth in schools, they can use that tool. We'll be releasing that tool later this year once the grades come out, and the parents will be able to compare, you know, the state the state grades versus growth or growth looks like. So you may have, you know, a C school from the state, but this C school is showing tons of growth, and we may grade it as a B, and it may cause the parent to say, "Huh, I never would have even considered that school had I not, you know, thought of it in this way." So we'll be releasing that so parents can definitely use it as a resource to, as a resource to make informed decisions. Right. And this can be found on your website. Yes. We'll release it a blog post. We can share it. We can share it with you. Okay, cool. And so this is the last thing um, before we, we really end. One thing that really concerns me is that um, the process to select a school starts before, you know, grades uh, from the previous school year may be available. Um, And so what would you say to um, families who want to make um, a data informed decision about a school to select when the data is coming out um, on a staggered schedule? What would you say to them? Um, Well, remember that you have from November until February. Um, So, I'm waiting until the grades come out. So I'm going to have my list ready. I'm going to have list ready. I'm going to have my pros and cons checked off. And then once the grades are released, then that will help me whittle down even further how I should rank schools. So even if I decided to put the application in November, I can still go back in January and change it. I can go and change it every single week. Just know that the last application you put in is the one that will actually be ran against the algorithm. Okay. So you can't wait till March 1st. It's too late. But um, anytime you decide you want to change it, I would say make that change very immediately um, just to ensure that your application is reflective of how you're feeling. All right, cool. And are there any last takeaways before we sign off, like these points that you definitely want to hit uh, with parents and other advocates for students? I would say that it's not perfect um, and that Enroll NOLA gets better every year. Um, they too also seek feedback from parents. So if you ever see that they're off, you know, asking for a focus group, or even if you want to just send them a quick email, like they're very responsive and they want to make sure that this tool is very user friendly um, to the folks that need it the most. And I would just say, um, just kind of reiterate the importance of like parents talking to each other. Like we know it's overwhelming. There's a lot of schools out there. <laughs> it can be a really overwhelming experience. Like. I would encourage parents to talk to each other, call the school leaders, you know, just reach out to folks in the community who keep their ears to the ground on like how schools are performing, how schools are serving kids and families. Um, just, just make those phone calls and have those conversations. It's going to be super important. Okay. 
Thank you very much, Ramisha and Gary from N Navigators for joining us. Um, we are going to also, with this webinar, have handouts um, that include a lot of the data points that you talked about, as well as resources and tools for parents to access um, so that when they go into one app, they can feel empowered. Um, hopefully the frustration um, will calm down, but then also we still want parents to be able to advocate for high quality schools everywhere, not just in specific places. And we want them to be able to trust whatever system is in place. We want them to be able to trust that it's working on the best, on the, of what their um, student um, or their child needs. And so though the system is not perfect, we do need to make sure that we're holding people accountable to get it to a better place um, so that all families feel like they, one, actually do have a choice and that those choices are all quality. But I'd like to thank you very much for joining. Um, and I look forward to seeing you um, later at the happy hour to if you want to um, that we're hosting um, after this webinar is released to speak more with parents and just have an informal networking conversation with them um, should they have any questions.